Hey, Christine. What's up? Oh, hey, Yuri. I'm just putting some leaves together just to show how much they are the same and yet different. They can also be decorative. Don't you think it looks pretty? For sure. But wait, I know from photosynthesis that green leaves get a green color because of chlorophyll. So how do yellow, orange, and red colored leaves get there? Um, uh, you know, I've wondered about that. Especially when I look at autumn pictures in the internet. They look so beautiful together. It does look awesome. So tell me, how are these different colors present in these leaves? I guess, like us humans, leaves are pretty much alike. We may come in different skin colors, but we're all made of the same thing. And if we have melanin, I guess plants have chlorophyll. That's a great comparison. Not as great as the person who will help us learn more about this. She's the first Asian to win the Intel International Excellence in Teaching Award and even has a planet named after her. Planet Bio, which is 9 kilometers in diameter and is located between Mars and Jupiter. Wow! You're talking about Dr. Giuseppe Bio, right? Yes, I am. And I hear she has a new teacher to introduce that will also help us learn more about photosynthesis. What are we waiting for? Let's get started! Understanding how plants manufacture their own food and the impact of this process not only in plants but on the entire ecosystem as well enable us to understand and appreciate nature more. Very good. Today, we're visiting teacher Erica to help her with her experiment. Hi, Dr. Bio. Hi, students. Hi, Hi teacher Erica. Erica. Are you ready to help me? Yes, ma'am. I leave you here today. Have fun with your experiment. Bye, ma'am. Ma Come on, guys. You already know that leaves contain pigments which are mainly responsible for the photosynthetic process in plants, right? This leaf, for example, most likely contains chlorophyll, judging from its prominent green color. But that is not all. Among its millions of pigments, it may also have other pigments like carotene, orange, xanthophyll, yellow, or anthocyanin, red. Just by looking at its leaf color, you cannot identify the pigments because they are in a mixture. In order for us to separate and identify these pigments, we will use a method called chromatography. Out of its many types, what we will perform today is paper chromatography. For this experiment, we will be using filter paper, Pencil and ruler, scissors and masking tape, mortar and pestle, beaker, watch glass and dropper, and isopropyl alcohol. And of course, marshmallow. Enzo, there are no marshmallows in this experiment. <laughs> Let's prepare a 7 by 10 centimeter filter paper, making sure that its height is shorter than the beaker. up from the bottom of the sheet, let's mark four points with a pencil.
Across the sheet, about 1 cm below the top edge, let's draw a line. Then we'll cut the rectangle around the edges. This sheet will be our chromatogram, where our pigments will be separated. Then we need to prepare leaf extracts. To do this, we use a mortar and pestle to grind the leaves and squeeze out the juice. We only need a small amount for each plant. Then, we will draw some leaf extracts onto a tip of a dropper. The height of the extract on the tube must be approximately 1 mm. Then, we briefly touch the tip of the extract onto the filter paper so that a small spot of extract seeps onto the paper. We'll let this spot dry for a few minutes and then repeat the process two or three more times. Then we'll attach the chromatogram onto the watch glass. Then, we fill this beaker with a isopropyl alcohol up to 1 cm from the bottom. Then, we place the filter paper inside the beaker, making sure that the pigment spots are above the alcohol level. The alcohol level is rising along the filter paper. You're right, Alfonso. We will wait until the alcohol level reaches the pencil line near the top edge. Hmm. I can see the extract spots being deformed. They look oval shaped now. I can see their colors separating. Now they form new spots. Time's up. Now, the extracts have separated into their component pigments. We'll leave this paper to dry for a few minutes, then we'll label all the spots. From what we have learned about pigments, the orange spots must be carotene, the yellow, xanthophyll, and the green, chlorophyll. Correct! So we can see that the dancalan extract has two pigments, chlorophyll and xanthophyll. Also, the croton extract has chlorophyll, xanthophyll, and anthocyanin. The Rio Discolor extract has chlorophyll and anthocyanin. And finally, the papaya extract has chlorophyll and xanthophyll. Very good! Now that you know what pigments are present in each plant, what can you predict about its photosynthesis? Ma'am, dangkalan and papaya do not have anthocyanin. We can therefore predict that these plants are less able to absorb green light, which is the color absorbed by the anthocyanin. However, all of them are able to carry out photosynthesis because all of them have chlorophyll A. Very good. Any other observations, Ashley? Hmm. Earlier, I was wondering why we really had to use pencil in marking the paper. Now I realized that if we used ink, its pigments could have separated along with our extracts and interfered with our results. You are right! Now you see how useful chromatography is in separating mixtures. Also, keep in mind that aside from the pigments, there may also be other separated components from our extracts. 
only that the spots they formed are colorless. Did you have fun assisting in this experiment? Yes, yes ma'am. With this activity, I hope you'll better appreciate the marvels of the living systems, not just by listening and reading about them, but more importantly, by seeing and experiencing them yourselves. As Confucius said, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Do you know why do these leaves differ in color? Sure, Christine. Leaves have millions of pigments in them, including chlorophyll. Like in the experiment, a leaf gets its color based on the combination of pigments present in them. Whether chlorophyll, which is responsible for the green, or carotene, which is responsible for the orange, xanthophyll for the yellow, and anthocyanin for the red. Each leaf or plant is different because of its pigment composition. You got it, Yuri. Now when we look at leaves, plants, and nature, we don't just admire them for their beauty. We can appreciate them more because of everything that's in them that make them beautiful, like people. What's inside is what truly really counts. Beauty truly comes from within. with teacher Erica here in the coastal area of Tangalan Aklan to learn more about nature. What happened, Alfonso? Uh, ma'am, it was the ball. He tripped on the ball? No, we played with the ball, ma'am. Fun, actually. Uh, ma'am, the manhole. You fell in the manhole? No, I jumped over the manhole, ma'am. <laughs> what happened, Alfonso? Ma'am, there were lions. He was beaten by a lion? No, we played with the lions, ma'am. They were very friendly. <laughs> oh, ma'am, there were a lot of piranhas. Piranhas on this beach? They're on the Nile River. No, we saw a picture of a piranha. They were very cute, ma'am. What really <laughs> happened, Alfonso? Um, cramps. You got cramps? You should rest for a while. That happens when you don't give your body enough time for cellular respiration. You really need to rest for proper cellular respiration. Mm. By cellular respiration, ma'am, do you mean the process of producing energy from food? Yes, Enzo. But ma'am, what form of energy does cellular respiration produce, ma'am? Cellular respiration produces energy as heat, which is used to regulate body temperature. But more than that, Cellular respiration produces chemical energy stored in the high energy molecules of adenosine triphosphate or ATP, nicotinamine adenine dinucleotide or NADH, and flavin adenine dinucleotide or FADH2. When a phosphate group attaches to a molecule of ADP to form ATP, these high energy molecules are like the currency for chemical energy. Right, Ashley. Cellular respiration can occur in two types. Anaerobic, which does not require oxygen, and aerobic, which requires oxygen. In most organisms like us, for example, respiration takes place in the presence of oxygen. Thus, it is classified as aerobic respiration. In some organisms, like yeast and other forms of bacteria, respiration occurs in the absence of oxygen. This is classified as anaerobic respiration. In this process, only a little of the chemical energy in glucose is harvested. Like other biological processes, I'm sure that respiration is also carried out by small chemical processes to produce its general equation. That's correct. It is also important to note that all of these reactions are facilitated by enzymes, which have very specific functions. 
Let me describe to you how carbohydrates, our primary energy source, is used to produce energy during cellular respiration. So if one glucose molecule produces two pyruvic acid molecule and one pyruvic acid molecule forms two ATPs, then one glucose molecule comes with four ATPs. But two ATP molecules were used to split glucose. The net energy output of glycolysis for each molecule of glucose is two ATPs and two NADH molecules. Very good students, that's the end of glycolysis. Let us proceed now to the second stage of an aerobic respiration, which is fermentation. Hmm, fermentation sounds very familiar to me. Is it the same process used to produce ethyl alcohol in wines and beverages? And is it the same process used when yeast produces carbon dioxide? to make bread rice? Yes, very good, students. This time, we'll proceed with the second stage of aerobic respiration, the pyruvic acid breakdown. As you will see later, respiration involving oxygen produces much more energy than anaerobic respiration. Also, these succeeding steps take place inside the mitochondria of the cell. When you force your muscles to exert energy so fast that your respiratory system cannot provide enough oxygen, there will be a buildup of NADH and FADH2 in your muscle cells. When these molecules are not used in the electron transfer chain, the Krebs cycle will stop. Now we're at the end of aerobic respiration, which is the electron transport chain. So from the 10 NADH molecules and the 2 FADH2 molecules from the previous stages, 32 ATPs are formed. That's right. If we add this to the previously formed 4 ATPs, we will have a grand total of 36 ATPs for the whole aerobic cycle. 36 ATPs from aerobic respiration and 2 ATPs from anaerobic respiration? Now that's a big difference. I'm glad that I was born an aerobic organism. Of course. What else you want to be? A yeast? Well... You seem to be feeling better now, Alfonso. Yes, ma'am. Now that I understand more about the process of respiration, I know that the little things I do can affect the processes in my body. I wouldn't want to interfere with those complicated processes. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. More than learning about science, you should learn the importance of the things that you know. So, everybody, ready for the next round? Yes, yes ma'am! You guys wanna sing? Bye, Bye.